Words, no matter whether they are vocalized and made into sounds or remain unspoken as thoughts, can cast an almost hypnotic spell upon you. You easily lose yourself in them and become hypnotized into implicitly believing that when you have attached a word to something, you know what it is. The fact is, you don't know what it is. You have only covered up the label, the mystery with a label. Everything, a bird, a tree, even a simple stone, and most certainly a human being, is ultimately unknowable. All we can perceive, see, experience, is the surface level of reality, less than the tip of an iceberg. When you look at something and let it be without imposing a word or mental label on it, a sense of awe arises within you and its essence silently communicates itself back to you. This is what great artists sense and succeed in conveying in their art. Van Gogh didn't just say, that's just an old chair. He looked and looked and looked. Then he sat in front of the canvas and took up the brush. The chair itself would have sold for the equivalent of a few dollars. But the painting of that same chair today would be worth $25 million. The way you look at something can greatly affect its value, just like with words and with human beings. When you don't cover up the world with thoughts and labels, a sense of the miraculous returns to your life that was lost a long time ago when humanity, instead of using thought, became possessed by thought. Things regained their newness, their freshness, and the greatest miracle is the experiencing of your essential self as prior to any words, thoughts, and labels. We need to disentangle our sense of I from all the things it has become mixed up with. Don't only look at a person through your perspective, but see them as a being independent of yourself. Because the quicker you are in attaching mental or verbal labels to things, people, or situations, the more shallow and lifeless your reality becomes. Wisdom is lost, and so are joy, love, creativity, and aliveness. But, of course, we have to use thoughts and words. They have their own beauty. But do we need to become imprisoned in them? Language, words, reduce reality to something the human mind can grasp, which isn't very much. Language consists of five basic sounds produced by the vocal cords. Those are the vowels A, E, I, O, and U. The other sounds are consonants produced by air pressure, S, F, G, and so forth. Do you believe some combination of such basic sounds could ever explain who you are? The word I embodies the greatest truth and the deepest error, depending on how it is used. In conventional usage, it is not only one of the most used words in the language, together with the related words, me, myself, mine, and my, but it's also one of the most misleading. The word I embodies the primordial error, a misperception of who you are, an illusory sense of identity. Your reality becomes a reflection of the original illusion, and this is the ego. When I was a young child, I learned the word I and started to equate it with my name, which I equated with who I am. Then other thoughts came and merged with the original I thought. Um, it became identified with my possessions. So when my toy breaks down or is taken away, 
intense suffering would arise, not because of any intrinsic value that the toy had. Um, I soon lost interest in it. It became uh, replaced with other toys, other objects, but because of the thought of mine. The toy became part of my developing sense of self, of I. And so as I grew up, the word I became identified with other thoughts, like gender, possessions, the sense perceived body, nationality, race, religion. Other thoughts the I identifies with are likes and dislikes, and also things that happened to me in the past, the memory of which are thoughts that further define my sense of self as me and my story. They are nothing else than thoughts held together precariously by the fact that they are all invested with a sense of self. This mental construct is the ego. which also leads to putting labels on people as you associate them with something as well, as an extension to the I thought. So the reason why such acute suffering occurs is concealed in the word my, and it is structural. The unconscious compulsion to enhance one's identity with association with an object is built into the very structure of the egoic mind. The people in the advertising industry know very well that in order to sell something that people don't really need, they must convince them that it will add something to how they are seen by themselves or by others. And so, by implication, add something to their sense of self. They do this, for example, by telling you that you will stand out from the crowd by using this product. And so, by implication, be more fully yourself. So in many cases, you're not buying a product, but an identity enhancer. Paradoxically, what keeps the so-called consumer society going is the fact that trying to find yourself through things doesn't really work. Ego satisfaction is short-lived, and so you keep on buying, keep consuming, keep wanting more. But we cannot really honor things if we use them as a means to self-enhancement, which is exactly what the ego does. Ego identification with things creates attachment to things, obsession with things, which in turn creates our consumer society and economic structures where the only measure of progress is always more. The unchecked striving for more, for endless growth, is a dysfunction and a disease. It is the same dysfunction the cancerous cell manifests, whose only goal is to multiply itself, unaware of the fact that it is bringing about its own destruction by destroying the organism of which it is a part. Some economists are so bound to the notion of growth that they can't let go of the word, so they refer to a period of recession as negative growth. We need to be alert and honest in order to find out, for example, whether our sense of self-worth is bound with the things we possess. Do certain things induce a subtle feeling of superiority or importance? Does the lack of them make you feel inferior? Do you feel resentful or angry when someone has more than you or when you have lost the prized possession? Here's a story. My parents and I moved around a lot, and recently we've moved to Turkey. And while unpacking our bags and boxes, my mom was relentlessly looking for our family's ring, one that has been passed down through generations. It was becoming to look very clearly that the ring was lost. And so after trying to hopelessly find the ring, I finally asked my mom if it will affect us in any way. After all, it's just an object, I said. A couple of days later, she eventually found the ring. But I now realize that in order to calm down my mom, I should have asked, has who you are, who we are, been diminished in any way, shape, or form? I understand now that you can care and value for things, but whenever you get so attached to them, you will know is the ego. And you are never really attached to a thing, but to a thought that has me, mine, or mine in it. 
Whenever you completely accept the loss, you go beyond your ego, and who you are, the I am, which is consciousness itself, emerges. Because you represent more than your objects, and so do others, so don't put a label on them based on what they own. Also, going back to words, the ego acknowledges any sort of perceived diminishment in the form of verbal communication. Automatic ego repair mechanisms come into effect to restore the mental form of me. When someone blames or criticizes me, that to the ego is a diminishment and it will immediately attempt to repair itself through self-justification, blaming, or defense. Whether the other person is right or wrong is irrelevant to the ego, which is much more interested in self-preservation rather than the truth. When someone criticizes you or blames you, instead of immediately retaliating and defending yourself, do nothing. Allow the self-image to remain diminished and be alert to how that feels like deep inside you. For a few seconds, it may feel uncomfortable as you have a shrunken size, but then you may feel an inner spaciousness that feels completely alive. You haven't been diminished at all. In fact, you have expanded. You may then come to an amazing realization. When you are seemingly diminished in one way, but remain in absolute non-reaction, not just externally, but also internally, you realize that nothing real has been diminished, and that you, in fact, have expanded. True power, who you are beyond form, can then shine through the apparently weakened form. Turn the other cheek is a very famous expression parents often tell their children. And this shows that they are more mature, and there is a reason for it. But it doesn't mean, of course, that you invite abuse or turn yourself into the victim of unconscious people. Sometimes a situation may demand that you tell someone to back off in no uncertain terms. But without egoic defensiveness, there will be power behind your words, yet no reactive force. Thus, you become an utterly changed human being with heightened perception and sensitivity to what really matters. You become reborn as a human being who can see through stereotypical labels the purest form of what can humanly be perceived. You start to cherish yourself and those around you and stop letting words or labels fuel your ego. Strive to become reborn. Thank you.